Let's pray, shall we? Amen. That got you, didn't it? <laughs> you don't need me to pray for you. I, none of this is in my, any of my thinking or my sermons, and I just thought I'd mention this in passing. Um, you all come here and you're thinking, well, yeah, do I want to change today? Do I want to hear something of God today in the sermon? Do I want to hear something from his word? Do I want to learn something? You can pray that yourself, can't you? So who prayed that? Who went, yeah, actually, really, Lord, come on, give me something. Or did you just wait for me to lead? You waited for me to lead. Okay. I walked in, um, uh, walked in this morning for various reasons I am not going to go into. But I walked in, and within about an hour of being here and stuff, I had this sense of, of how can I put this really... You heard the musicians uh, and the singers and, and Denzel and putting things together, getting, getting practicing and, and you heard some chairs being moved around and, and various other things. And it, it had that sense of, and I mean this nicely, I mean this in a really loving way, so hear me carefully. Uh, I had this sense of messiness. Does that make sense? This sense of this is just been a little bit chaotic, it sounds like. And it, 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 on one level it was, and on another level it wasn't. It was, it was chaotic, and order coming out of what felt like chaos in, in, in bringing something together. And it just had that sense of, yeah, but this is all right. It's okay to be messy. It doesn't have to be neatly pinned down to the last dot and, and every sort of T crossed. I mean, you know, we do, I know that whenever the worship leader, the meeting leaders are putting the meeting together, they spend time listening to God and, and actually listening to God about, you know, well, what do you want for this morning, Lord? And, and it's okay, when I put a sermon together, I do exactly the same thing. You're all right. And you sit there and you think, so you do have to put some togetherness to it. But we are human beings and we're not perfect. Anybody thinks they're perfect? You need to humbly now bow before the cross. Um, and so therefore then we're not always going to get it right. And if sometimes we're involved, it's going to be a little bit messy. And it's even now I can hear the kitchen rattling and, and with this and some people go, oh, it must be quiet, it must be silent in the sermon. Well, my gob's big enough. And it's okay because actually when you're out of here, out there, you need to listen to God the other six and a half days of the week. And I bet it's not quiet, is it? Anybody have a nice, quiet, oh, well, I do actually, nice, quiet office. Um, I have a neat, tidy office. It's even neater now. It's getting better. But... It's only quiet when the phone doesn't ring or my email doesn't go, ding, you have an email. Or I was meeting with people this week and the doorbell wouldn't stop ringing and I'm going, I'm expecting no one. So why are they ringing the doorbell? Go away. But we don't have nice, neat, quiet, peaceful, country type lives, do we? Oh, I so hope so in my retirement. That won't happen. But we, you know what I mean? So we have to listen to God in the mess and the glamour and, and the clamour and all of that, yeah? So why should church be any different? It's got absolutely nothing to do with my sermon. <laughs> Turn with me. Let's see if we could get into it and see what God's saying. Mark 7, verse 24 to 30. Mark 
Mark chapter 7, verse 24 to 30. Uh, uh, by the way, oh, uh, just while we're here, while you're, you're diving in and getting to that, Mark chapter 7, verse 24 to 30, all right? While you're clamoring, I'd just like to say, I have got my deodorant on today. The reason I'm saying that is because, fun, and so has Carlene and Timmy, and so has Miriam. Because we felt, well, they, didn't, they have not expressed it, but I felt this entire hair area was left alone. When you came in, you all went over here. <laughs> now, as good looking as I am, I'd rather you came over here. And I saw the back of your head rather than you seeing my face. I didn't mind looking at their faces. Don't even go there, Denzel. The point I'm making was, it was like, hello, what's wrong with this side? <laughs> I'm all right. It's not holy over here. Trust me. I'm there. Anyway, you're into Mark chapter 7, verse 24. Marvellous. Are you thinking, what are we doing this morning? I won't tell you what I'm thinking right now, John. <laughs> anyway, we, I sort of dip in and out of Mark. We are going through it sort of periodically. But there's times when I'm going to preach and I feel God says, actually, go and I want you to go and discuss and do this. So we're going back into Mark. So we left Mark last time when I spoke on Mark, or where Jesus had just tackled the Pharisees over, uh, and his own disciples, really, over tradition. Tradition and oral tradition and how man-made rules are snuffing out God's love almost, hindering it from taking effect. With me so far? And that's where we were in that part of chapter 7. So we're going to go on. We're now going to have Jesus having just left Galilee and gone into the northern, uh, to the north region of Tyre. I can't help it. Every time I hear that word, I think of cars. Going to the region of Tyre, the Gentile land of Tyre. And I'm just going to read the rest of it. He didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in. But he couldn't keep it a secret. Right away, a woman who heard about him came and fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile, born in somebody, Syrian Phoenicia, Jesus told her, first I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord. But even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. Good answer, he said. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. When she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. So Jesus travels off to the land of Tyre, Phoenicia. I have spent a week practicing that, being corrected by joy on various occasions. So that's why I said, somebody else just recite it back to me. It's pagan land, actually so pagan in its culture and its very being that it literally was a detestable place to the Jews. The Jews did not cope very well with pagans. They believed in one God. Pagans believed in all these other gods and multiple gods and all of that. They really couldn't cope. And you, you see that in Acts where Paul, when he's in Athens and sees the multiple god worship, it really absolutely yanks at him and it really decries how he feels towards it. But uh, in Phoenicia, uh, in the land of Tyre here, uh, it was so pagan. It's a place actually of Jezebel. It's where Jezebel comes from. No Jezebel? Yeah, and the grief she called the Jews and Elisha, no, Elijah. I was doing that all this week as well. Elijah, um, 
and, and all of that. And also, if you look in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 26, if you just want to keep your finger in Mark, let's just go quickly to Ezekiel, and I shall just read Ezekiel 26. So, just to give you an idea, this whole 26 is related to them. On February the 3rd, during the 12th year of King Joachim's captivity, his, this message came from me, the Lord, Son of Man, Tyre has rejoiced over the fall of Jerusalem. Notice that. Tyre has rejoiced over the fall of Jerusalem, saying, Ha! She who was the gateway to the rich trade routes of the east has been broken, and I am the heir. Because she has been made desolate, I will become wealthy. Therefore, this is what the sovereign lord says. I am your enemy, O Tyre. Not a good place to be. And I will bring many nations against you. And it goes on. So there's been a long-running feud, really, between Tyre and Israel, the Jewish nation. And it goes on. You look in uh, Zechariah 9.3. Tyre has built a strong fortress and has made silver and gold as plentiful as dust in the streets. They had a real problem with Tyre's wealth and prosperity as well. Or as the great first century Jewish historian Josephus, jo no. Josephus, I do know how to pronounce him, so I studied him for nearly a year. <laughs> this is not a good, it's messy morning, all right? It means my mouth is messy this morning, bear with us. He says of the inhabitants of Tyre that to Jews, they are notoriously our bitterest enemies. This is in Jesus' time, or just after. So the relationships are not exactly, yo, let me give you a hug. They're a little bit fractious to say the least, yeah? <coughs> sort of place that the Jewish Messiah should go to, surely. Then again, maybe not. It's not the sort of place you'd find the Jewish Messiah. Now, they're not quite at war at this point, or else because there was sort of the Jews going in and going out. It wasn't that... But it's not the sort of place, Gentile land, pagan worship, really, really quite, between the Jews and the Phoenicians, there was quite a, this. Not the sort of place you expect to find the Jewish Messiah turning up, yeah? Who, just, just imagine it for a minute. Imagine you've got something against, we're in Middlesex, say you've got something against another county, I'm not naming any, but say you've got something against another county in, 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 in the land, yeah? Imagine you, and you're the head of Middlesex, and you're going into that county. Not the sort of thing you do, really, is it? You send minions off. Because you're going to say, I'm really here for Middlesex. Why would I go off to here? Well, we've got bitter fighting going on. We were at, uh, I was going to say, while I was on holiday, um, just very quickly, real quick, uh, while I was on holiday, just to give you an idea, uh, we were sort of Devon and Dorset, okay, and we were in Dorset initially, and there was this woman announcing, she was a farmer, and she was helping show how she uh, get her dog to uh, round up ducks. It was quite fascinating to watch. And anyway, her opening gambit was, I'm from Devon, yes, I know, I'm in enemy territory, that was interesting. I thought, gosh, that battle's still got. No, no. But you know what I mean. It's just that, just, I think it's funny, just gentle banter. This is not gentle banter. Okay? You with me? So, anyway, Jesus goes to a house where he's wanting no one to know who he is. Maybe that's why he's gone into this foreign land. Now, in Mark, it is down that he's on his own. But in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, his disciples are with him. And to be honest with you, scholars can't quite figure out really why Jesus wanted to go there. Why does he want to go to a house that nobody knows him? But if we take the Matthew reading that the disciples are with him, and if you take into account that in the early part here of chapter 7, that Jesus is struggling to have teach the disciples on his own without constantly crowds coming at them. He's not able to spend quality time with him. The view is probably actually wanted to go here with the disciples to be able to teach them. 
because if you look in the earlier passages, they're still quite slow and delard and haven't quite actually got the concept of why Jesus is here. So that's potentially one reading. Either way, all we know is that he wanted to be alone so no one knew who he was and what he was there to do. Clearly, Jesus was really hoping that his reputation hadn't gone before him. Fat chance. A woman, a Gentile woman, this woman, a pagan woman, has the audacity to beg this Jewish teacher to cast out a demon of her pagan daughter. I would like you to imagine just for a moment. Got your imagination hats on? Hello? Good, thank you. I'll turn the heating off in a minute. It's obviously getting too comfortable. So imagine for a minute, you want to go to a place where you want to be alone. Imagine for a minute you're a Christian. Oh, you are. It's okay. It's good. And you want to be alone. You don't want to see any other people. You don't want to see any other Christians. Is that easy or hard to imagine? You don't want to see anybody else who knows who you are. You want to disappear. Nobody knows what you do for a living. Yeah? You got that so far? So you decide, I'm going to the next county. Nobody really knows who I am. I'm going to stay in this house that nobody knows who I am. You, you, you there so far? I want to be alone. I want nobody to know who I am. You don't particularly like the people in that county, but at least you'll be left alone. You've got that imagination so far, yeah? So there you are, eating your supper, knocking back your glass of coffee. You thought I was going to say wine, didn't you? And all of a sudden, somebody from that county comes in and begs at your feet and interrupts you completely, begging you, Lorraine, Lorraine, please cast out. And you're going, I'm resting, get away. You all right? I'm fine. Good. <laughs> but you get the point. Did it shock you that, what did he just do? Yeah? Well, imagine that just for a moment. So here comes, effectively, between the two counties, your most bitter enemy, asking you for help. What would you, what would be your reaction internally? I'm actually, it's a real question. So you might have to be slightly honest. So really, you've had a, there's somebody who's come from a, it's come from the county, I, Maybe tribe is a better word for some people, I don't know. But they've come from a tribe where there's clearly been, between the two counties, a long-running feud. And somebody from the other county has come running in, begging at the feet, asking for your help. What, if you're honest, is your reaction? And don't give me the Christian ease answer, all right? I know what the one is right in the Bible, but let's give our honest human answer. Hang on, microphones. You're not my priority. Thank you, Denzel. Anyone else? Who helps? Hands up. Let's go. Oh, thanks, Anne. Pastor. Pastor. How the mighty falls. How the mighty falls? Not a chance. Not a chance. Who's going to suddenly put their hand up at the front? Go on. Yeah, see, I knew it. <sighs> Faster, Pastor. Did you really just say that? You've got the nerve you... after all you've done. Oh. Do you know, I'm going to pray for some of you later. I just thought I'd mention it in passing. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh. No. Barry. Oh, you're for real. Get on your bike, Buster. <laughs> Anybody else? This is not funny. 
I don't care. I don't care. Good. Honest. Can I have my supper first? Have my supper first. Ah. Oh. What do you want from me? Ah, what do you want from me? Yes. Anybody else? No, that'll do. I've had my exercise now, that's so. Honest answers. And I tell you now, I think some of you, if it's really somebody you've had a long running feud between, I lay it under a one, it would be even more bitter and worse than that. So we have then, way you evil person, almost, that sort of sense of, I'm not dealing with you. Charity begins at... with a rhyming chime as well. Well, you'll be pleased to see what Jesus' response is then. He agrees with you. Because Jesus said, first I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Ouch. Ouch, he's just called her a... Could you put a bit more passion in it, folks? He's called her a... When you read that passage for the very first time, the second, the third, the fourth, yeah? And you've not yet had the benefit of, uh, of Kevin's beta on the Bible course that uh, he's running at the moment and how to study the Bible. When you read that, you don't go dog, do you? You go dog. Jesus, compassionate, died on the cross, rose again, all supposedly loving, has just called a woman who we say trying to explain to you he's not a male chauvinist, he really actually put women actually more first because of the way his society was county cultural, has just called her a dog. Are you all right with that? No. Have you struggled with it? Yes. Do you understand what he's talking about? But so far on the surface, that's it, isn't it? He's called her a dog. If it wasn't children in the room, I'd use the female version. That this effectively, that's what most people read that as being. It begins with B, if you don't know what a female dog is called. No, 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 I'm just trying to... But the way you read it, Belinda, some of us read that. Or do you just skip over it? And do you just skip over it and decide, actually, I don't understand. I can't cope. That makes no sense to me. And the rest of Jesus that I know, I'll move on, yeah? yeah. Let's unpack it, shall we? Let's put our Lord in a much better, truthful light. Firstly, to a Jew, we see it both in the Old and the New Testament, dogs are associated with with uncleanliness. Anybody got a dog, by the way? No? No? Wow. When I first... Is that what I say, love? Yeah. When, uh, when Joy and I were first dating, many, 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 many months ago, um, <laughs> we did celebrate our 18th year of marriage. But when we first started dating, uh, uh, Joy's, my mother-in-law, uh, trained uh, puppies guide do for guide dogs. So these are puppies that are going to eventually be guide dogs, and she trained them. One of the rules back then, I don't know if it still exists now, but when those guide dogs retire, the train, the original trainer actually gets offered, do you want the dog back? My mother-in-law... Yes, please, every time. So when I first started dating Joy, there were three grown, I'm going to say Labradors for now, because some were across, but effectively I say Labradors, that's it. Living in the house. You know, it's only a three-bedroom house. These are not small dogs. And if you think, by the way, that guide dogs are really well-trained, look how well-behaved they are on the streets. That is when they got their harnesses on. When they haven't, it's like having children in the house. 
Anyway, another story for another time. So dogs. So see, for me here, we think of dogs as quite clean in this country because we're a nation apparently of dog lovers and cat lovers, yeah? So we don't say, but back here, we're talking unclean. We're talking considered absolutely unclean. They ate the garbage and dead animals. That was their role. They were street roamers. It was also used, the word dog, as a rude remark about people who are considered worthless and dispensable. To a Jewish person then, Gentiles were regarded as ignorant, godless and pagan idolaters. Rabbis would state that the people of the world, i.e. pagans, are like dogs. So far, are you feeling warm and fuzzy about our Lord Jesus? Going slightly further back in chapter 7, when Jesus challenged the Pharisees over clean and unclean things, he declared all things clean. Well, hang on a minute. So we've got a contradictory Jesus now, haven't we? Jesus who would declare food and things are clean, but a human person, a woman begging at his feet, he's just called her a dog. Still feeling warm and fuzzy about our Lord Jesus at the moment? You're waiting for the punchline, aren't you? There isn't one. No, there is. Okay. There is a word used uh, in Greek uh, for an unkempt dog, a messy dog, a scum of the earth dog, a street dog, for want of a better phrasing. One who isn't like a nice guide dog, you know, well kept, well clean, well groomed, looked after, fed every day at four o'clock without fail. The Greek word for an unkept dog is quite obvious, but there is another form that is used here in Mark, and it's also used in Matthew, and it's the only place it's used in the New Testament, is of this story. And actually, when we unpack the true meaning, it is normally means a small dog that is kept as a house pet. So there are two distinctions here. There is the word that Jesus could have used, meaning a street dog, scum of the earth, you eat corpses. And the word actually was used, which is tra trained house pet, part of the household, a looked after dog. So does that make you feel a little bit better? A little bit warmer now? A little bit fuzzier about our Lord Jesus at this point? And in her response back to Jesus, our pagan lady, she uses the same word about herself and her child, which indicates she took no offence by what Jesus did. I'm sure if I walked up to any one of you in this room and called you a dog in your face... I think I might have a few bruises afterwards. Yes, Timmy? You did say slap me in my face just then, didn't you? Yeah, we're just recording this. Church treasurer said he'll slap the pastor if I called him a dog. What was that you were talking about, Grace? Anyway. Okay? If I came up to you and called you dog, I think you'd have a reaction. But if you understood that what I meant by that was almost slightly, only slightly I hasten to add, a term of endearment, you might go, thank you, yes, I am a dog. <laughs> go with the flow on this one. <laughs> That's Jesus' old life, so what old does it make? Okay, so now we have a light bulb moment. Or well, you should by now have a light bulb moment. Please have a light bulb moment. <laughs> Jewish nation, quite rightly at the time, or within reason, considered themselves children of God. 
Everybody else was not. That simple. It was a very clear, dividing line. You either are or you're not. And see, they were the chosen people of Israel, therefore then they would consider themselves children of God. Anybody doesn't follow Yahweh or anything to do with Yahweh is not. Guess what? Same message runs today. We just like in our nice tolerant culture to try to blur the lines slightly. You either are or you're not. Slight hold on proceedings. Jim, I think your lift is here. Thank you, Debbie. So, sorry, I just saw somebody poking through, peering through the window. So they consider themselves children of God. And the word that Jesus is used here means literally biological children. You know, when he says, I gotta feed, well, I, I gotta, first I should feed the children, he's talking sort of sense of biological children, not his own biological children, but the term of how Israel considered themselves was actually children of God. And on one level, it's absolutely right, because Jesus first came for the Israel, for his own people. Initially, the gospel message, the good news that he brought, has to be for his own people first. They had to hear it and experience it first before it went out to the Gentiles, or effectively, you and me. Okay? So he's right, but he used this biological. But when the woman talks back to Jesus, when she says, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plate, the word she's using there actually is a, she changes the word slightly. It refers to the Jewish nation, but it's more inclusive because it actually is implying both children and servants in a Jewish household. Do you get the point? So she changes it, where Jesus initially seems to use the word deliberately to isolate just, you basically got to be born into the Jewish nation, yeah, direct bloodline. She's bringing it with a, yes, but also those servants who aren't born into the Jewish nation, who are part of the household. You, you with me? So that's what she's doing. She's changing it slightly. As uh, one commentator stated, the change in terminology suggests that the woman understands the mercies of God to extend beyond ethnic Israel. Hence, Jesus' answer, good answer, he said, now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. So, beyond finally realising that our Lord Jesus wasn't being rude, he wasn't being rude, he was saying actually a household pet is cast as part and parcel of the family. Yeah? A nation of dog lovers. Who has any pets of any nature? Cool. Cats, I bet. Gerbils. Fish. Yeah, okay. Be honest. In our nation, they're classed as part and parcel of the household, aren't they? Yeah, I have a cat. Effectively, he's the male son that I have. He's independent, rude, constantly screaming for his food. This morning, he just looked at me and meowed, and meowed, and meowed. You should see what... Yeah, I know, you've got the same problem. Fed him, he wasn't happy. Wanted then the milk from his cereal. Still wasn't happy. I literally, I could be sitting there, standing on the sofa with my bowl of cereal in my hand. He'll leap up onto the, 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 the footstool. Whew, head in. If I didn't... Get away. But then he gives you that look of... Who's seen that new advert? Where the man and the woman are doing things they shouldn't be doing, if you know what I mean, because they're not married. You've seen the new ever, and all of a sudden the music kicks in, and he's got his cat looking with his wide eyes. Say, so feed me. So he stops kissing the young lady that he's with and goes and feeds the cat instead and completely ignores her, yeah? It's like that. 
She's, that cat's part of his household. That's his priority. <laughs> what? No, no, I'm not talking about my own family. Struth. <laughs> Unbelievable. <sighs> there is not cross-cultural communication going on, there's just everybody in here is just being rude. <laughs> Clean your minds. <laughs> but I do notice when I might be ill, Joy goes, we'll go to the doctors, when the cat's ill, I'm taking him up the vet, she says. Who does she love more? She don't stick me in a cage and take me out to the doctors, does she? Unbelievable. Anyway, moving on. Rapidly, quickly. Yeah. It's kept you entertained, that's the main thing. Right, so household pets. So this is what Jesus is saying. Actually, there's this sense of actually, he wasn't calling her a dog in the rudest sense. He was actually almost terming it as a term of affection, that you're included into the household. You know, you get a pet, you either buy the pet or rescue it from uh, RSPCA or that sort of thing. Well, in some cases, pets adopt your house. Strange, isn't it? They just suddenly walk in and adopt your household. Um, but that's what you... No, I won't tell that story. Another time. Um, so you, you bring the family in, and this is the same... In my head, this is the same term. See, the Jewish nation are meant to be the light to the nations. They are meant to be the saviour to the nations, to talk about the blessings of God and to exhibit the blessings of God by following him and doing that. And, well, they didn't, as you know, their history, they didn't do that very well. Hence, Jesus came. And he was then, but they were meant to also welcome and bring in and adopt and pull in from the other nations, others into God's covenant. Do you get the point? And this is what they're meant to do. So like taking a household pet, you bring that pet into your home. And this analogy clearly falls down with a lot of people because you don't have one. But when you bring it in, you make it part of your family. The actual animal has more rights probably than, strangely enough, the humans that live in the family. Firstly, you have to insure them. It gets really expensive if you don't. But you bring them in, you feed them. They actually are the priority. When I think about my boy, Right, Toffee, or our boy Toffee, he's the first to be fed. I kid you not. He has no problem in turning around and going, meowing at us, going, come on, give me my rights, give me what I should be having. Give it to me now. Yeah? He, he gets that. And he gets round your feet, and he don't leave you alone until you've dished out the food and given it to him. And he's in and out. I literally, there's times I'm on my trip up and, oh, that's going to be the bottom of the stairs in a minute. I'm going to do a suit man. But he has no problem in begging and asking and requesting and no sense of me, oh, be quiet, stop talking, works. He'll keep going. And this is the same thing. This woman came begging recognising that she could be adopted into the covenant with God, with Jesus. And the point that she actually got it like that straight away, and the fact that Jesus said, good answer, was actually to show the disciples who were meant to be part of the in-nation still weren't getting it. They had to be taken off to a room to be taught. But she got it. Like that, in the mess of her life, in the mess of her demon-possessed daughter, in the fact that she was in a messy society that worshipped multiple gods and did all these strange things, she got it. She got, she could come begging, for want of a better phrasing, prostrating herself before Jesus, you're Jesus by the way, prostrating before Jesus and saying... Give me what I want, please, because I know this is the right thing. This is God's will.
And the analogy that's used is actually about sitting at a table and having the scraps of the food that the children are eating. Let's be honest, children are not, not the, how long does it take to train a child to eat properly? I'm f nearly 46, I haven't still got there yet. But you drop things on the floor. Come on, we as adults drop things on the floor, don't we? A pea rolls off the fork and lands on the floor. Yeah, or whatever. And that's that imagery, the scraps falling on the floor, finishing a chicken bone and chucking it over your, chucking it onto the carpet. And I don't do that, all right? But just, but that's the sort of imagery you've got here of a child not quite being able to eat in the scraps and the household pet going, Vroom. I'm going to eat it. The child doesn't starve. They've had abundance. And there's still more left for spillage over for the household pet. The same works for us. Earlier on, uh, Denzel led us brilliantly in crying out to God, and so did Timmy in his prayer, in our crying out to God for the things that are on our heart. Effectively, I don't quite like the term, but let's go with it for a minute, begging God to answer the prayer for the world, for our community, and maybe for some of you, it was stuff with you. And I think what we have the problem is, is we think there are times that we're not quite sure if really God's going to just give us there, 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 go away. Let me pet your head, stroke the back of your tail, go away. Yeah? Actually, some of you might think you're almost like a cat. Sorry, I'm going to use this analogy for a minute. That actually, when the cat leaps up onto you to ask you for something... You almost think God's going to go, just pick you up from under your belly and put you on the floor. Say, go away, not now. I'm not interested. Get out the house. But we actually should be more like my cat, our cat, constantly at the feet asking and listening. Realising that God's abundance actually says, yes, I want to feed you well. I want to give you things that you're asking for. As long as it's within my will and what I want. I mean, don't worry, my boy Toffee, I'm sure he would love to have a piece of my curry, but I don't think it will do him very much good. So he's not going to get that. He's going to get food that is going to be good for him. It's the same thing. We've got this Gentile woman begging. And she effectively had zero right. She was part of the enemy of the Jews. Long-running feud. She had no right, but she still thought, no, God will give this because he is a good God. And she wasn't really asking for scraps. She knew that. She was asking for the choice meat. And we have got to learn to do that. So you don't just go, well, ask once, that'll do. It should be like my cat, constantly at my feet until you get fed. You may not always get what you want because it's not good for you, but you will be fed with something that is right and proper. There is abundance in the kingdom of God. It doesn't have a credit card limit. that you then have to pay back. That's already done on the cross. And stop thinking you're a dog who has to work for the scraps. We are children of God. It makes it very clear in the Bible. There's also something else I just want to pick up from this teaching and then we're going to spend time, very quick time reflecting. I normally ask lots of questions, I ask, normally ask another question around it, but I don't want to do that, it doesn't feel right this morning. 
One of the things I've spoken about is actually long-running feuds. This story also tells us something about Jesus breaking down the barrier of feuds. This is history here. We're talking hundreds, thousands of years of long-running feud history between Israel and between uh, Tyre, Phoenicia, yeah? Okay? Jesus doesn't care about long-running feuds. He makes the approach to step over the barrier of that and to break the barrier down. Yes? This is where it gets a little bit uncomfortable now. Because I want you for a minute to think, what long-running feud have you inherited through maybe family, neighbours, Excuse me, but dare I say tribes? Maybe from a different nation. What long-running feud that's got nothing to do with you personally, but somehow you've decided, I've got to keep it up? Because they hurt my great, 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 great grandfather or my dad or my whatever. I ask you the question. We're meant to be little Jesus, yeah? We're meant to break the barriers. I want you now, with God, just to listen to him. Now. Now, you might really be feeling angry and bitter right now, thinking about it. Our Lord Jesus could have done the same in regards to Tyre. But not only did he go across into their region, he stayed in one of their houses. So I would say to you now, request God to start changing your heart. Be like the woman begging at Jesus' feet. Persistent. And now request that God gives an opportunity for the healing of that feud, whatever that is, an opportunity for you to be the example of Jesus in that. Because whoever they are need, like us, to be called children of God. You might well be the catalyst that makes that happen for them. Recognising now, Lord, that there is no limit to the abundance of what you can do. Help us to be your children, eating at your table, giving out your abundance to others around us. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.